How's it going? <laughs> Brandon gave me three minutes to do this, and the truth is, to formally introduce somebody like Chris Brewster, you need 10 minutes. Um, he's accomplished a lot in his lifetime, but I'm just gonna hit on a few highlights. Uh, Chris uh, basically grew up in the Philippines, lived there for 10 years, over 10 years with his family. Uh, he has two brothers and a sister. And uh, he also met his best friend and his wife while living in the Philippines. And so they have uh, a huge heart for the nations as a result of their experience overseas. And, and also, Chris is married to Christy. And so if you ever text them or call them, make sure you put the right letters at the end of their name, okay? <laughs> Maybe a few times, I have not. Okay, they've been married for 31 years now. Uh, almost 32 on July the 13th, and they have nine children, four biological and five adopted, and we hope that's all that there are adopted, okay? <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, but also, Chris is the founder of Santa Fe South Charter Schools, which is the largest, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, okay, largest in-person charter school in the state of Oklahoma with over 4,400 students and 500 employees. That is a whole lot of people. Yeah. Chris uh, has made an incredible impact on the families in South Oklahoma City as a result, improving the education for our children uh, and providing a better hope for them through that avenue. He's also currently leading an effort uh, and hopes to, uh, it's called the Crossroads Renovation Project, and hopes to redo all Crossroads Mall to provide a place where family and children can thrive in South Oklahoma City. And I hope that that happens. We're gonna find out here in a month and a half if that's gonna happen or not. And just praying for God's provision for that so that families here can thrive, not just academically, but also spiritually and relationally in many other ways. Uh, Chris loves kids, okay? And he will probably tell you he would much rather work with kids than with adults, and I'll let him explain why. Um, but he really does love kids and has uh, spent his life impacting children across South Oklahoma City. Uh, but personally, Chris is one of my closest friends and I asked my wife about a month ago, I was like, is it weird that one of my closest friends is 55? And she said, <laughs> she said, no, it'll just be sad when he dies. <laughs> so, love you, bro. <laughs> yeah, three minutes are up. Okay. But uh, no, I know Chris to be a man of integrity uh, and a master of making uh, <laughs> uh, incremental gains, okay? And he has helped me make incremental gains in my life uh, physically as we've uh, worked out together for like eight years now, uh, but also relationally, mentally, and spiritually. And I look up to him so much and I'm so grateful for the impact he's had on my life and on my family's life. So, with that being said, would y'all welcome Chris Brewster up as he shows with us. Lauren, he'll pay for that on Monday when we work out. You know. Man, it is, I told, don't you believe Lauren said that though? We all know, you can deny it if you want, Lauren, but this church knows you, by the way. By the way, it's good to be here. Um, it's, it's a reminder that there are groups of, of people who gather in Jesus' name, communities in Oklahoma City, but the church is the church of Oklahoma City, right? So if Paul were writing a letter about the church in Oklahoma City, he wouldn't write individual churches down, right? We are the collective people of God in Oklahoma City. So we need to remind ourselves of that more often. And for many years, we've been able to do that in very specific ways uh, between first Western Hills and the well, and now together church in the well. We're grateful to be here, to be welcomed 
But this is our place too, right? We are the church in Oklahoma City, blessed to be in this spot. My responsibility today is to say the things that I've written down because I believe they're what God told me to. The Holy Spirit's responsibility is to tell you what you're supposed to take from this and your responsibility is to listen to the Holy Spirit. Do you know your job today? Do you know your assignment? Good, because it lets me off the hook. I'm gonna say my things. The Holy Spirit always does the Holy Spirit's work, but sometimes we don't position ourselves to respond accordingly. Let's do that today. God always allows us to grow and to gain when we earnestly seek him, we listen to the spirit, we pay attention to the words, right? So be in that posture today, let everything else just go from you. Genuinely pray at this moment that God would speak to you through the spirit. My words are not important, his words are. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we get started? Father, it's a gift to be with my brothers and sisters in the kingdom. It's also a gift to be here with those who are yet to be my brothers and sisters in the family of God. Today, that's my earnest prayer, that those who don't yet know the salvation that comes through Jesus alone will receive that today. This is my greatest, my greatest cry to you, Father, that there's a single person here that doesn't yet know you as their Savior, that they would be in a place to respond to receive the gift of salvation today. It is in Jesus, our Savior's name we pray, amen. You know, it's ironic. I, I told my wife just the other day that I didn't feel 55, and here's what Britt leads with. I, in fact, don't know <laughs> what it means to feel 55. I know I are, but I don't know what that is, really. It's just a number to me. I don't even know what, it, what the concept of feeling elderly is because I've seen some people who act elderly in their bodies, but not in their spirit and the way they approach life. So there seems to be the separation in those who genuinely are eternally young at heart and those who are getting old in their spirit. And I think it has to do with the way we are nourished and fed by the spirit of God or by the spirit of the world. One will not nourish us, the other one will. So I don't know what it feels like to be old. I know what it feels like to be able to recall lots of good things in my life though and memories are a sweet gift from God. Would you, would you acknowledge that with me? The gift of memory is an amazing thing. As far as we can tell, we're the only creatures in the animal kingdom with the type of specific memory that we have, where we can literally travel through time back to a place, an event, an occurrence, a person, and have a memory that brings real time joy and pleasure to us. What a gift. To be able to sit in this time, go back to a time past, and learn from that memory, again, the joy that we had, to get that joy all over again. Don't, don't waste that opportunity to remember. When you get a chance to remember, accept that gift from God. You know, sometimes these memories are recalled through something you can recall visually or something that you see visually causes you to have a memory. Sometimes it's the smell. But oftentimes for me, it's music. Does anybody have specific memories attached to music, right? And in fact, oftentimes, completely unbeckoned on our part, you hear a tune and a memory pops into your mind. You are literally transported in your mind back to a time or place where you heard that song. You know, I love the fact that music, this gift from God, can connect us with the human experience so powerfully. Another incredible gift of God that, that works in tandem with memory is music. Recent research, in fact, suggests that the music you listen to as a teenager has a more profound effect on your brain development than at any other time in your life. It sticks in your head. It forms your worldview and way of thinking. Now, I used to have people that would lecture us about listening to music when we were teenagers. As it turns out, they were right. Now brain researchers are saying that stuff is sticking and it sticks really well. In fact, I could prove that right now if I began to play from my, from my Apple Music the hits from the 80s. 
Some of you would start smiling and swaying and singing along. And 70s and 90s and 2000s, which are now becoming oldies. How weird is that, right? <laughs> How strange is that the 2000s are considered... Well, that's just another sad thing to think about right now. <laughs> but music has an incredible power to connect us with the times and memories that are years and even decades in our past. We were doing a workout one day. And something came on from like late 70s, hard rock, and somebody that was in the, in the group began to sing along. Somebody who's very conservative, very grown, has children. I'm like, dude, you listen to this? And he's like, I'm like, oh, it brings out the 80s, the 90s, the 70s in us when we hear this music. Those things that were a part of our life. And I am, I'm grateful for that. Many of the songs from the 80s bring me back to my high school years in the Philippines. And I had a largely wonderful time in my high school. I was in a boarding school in the Philippines, left home when I was 14 to be a part of a missionary kids school that was really an important thing to me. It was there that I became independent as a thinker and as a person. It was there that I began to adopt my faith as my own. I grew up in a genuinely, not nominally, genuinely Christian family a family that followed God with their lives, their lifestyle, their teaching and training. My parents gave to me a real upbringing in the Christian faith. But it was only around the 10th or 11th grade year of, of my life that I adopted that faith as my own. I was saved at seven, but the practice of my faith, the denominational adherence, the, the religion of my life, which is the alignment of the person's life, with what they know to be right, became mine when I was 16, 17 years old. And I can recall being discipled by youth leaders in church, by those who taught me music, our campus chaplain, coaches, in fact, pretty much every adult in my life, from my parents and coaches and teachers and pastors, had a hand in guiding me towards spiritual maturity, and I am grateful for this. I was a privileged young man to grow up with that many people who cared for my spiritual well-being as a young person. I can recall discovering music from men and women that attracted me not so much because of its contemporary genre, because Christian rock was really starting to come out at that time, but because it was created by people who were deeply in love with Jesus. And they used music to express that. Keith Green was among my favorites. Rich Mullins was emerging, and of course, Amy Grant with really big bangs was showing up on the scene, telling us you could actually have joy as you expressed your faith in Jesus Christ. But one of the many songs that affected me during that era actually came from several years earlier, a guy named Larry Norman. Anybody know who Larry Norman is? Raise your hand, show you're old. Okay, thank you. All right, Larry Norman wrote a song in 1969 entitled, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. And I remember encountering this song when I was in high school. I want you to kind of pay attention to these lyrics as I go through a couple of the verses. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. A man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise, turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears, and one's left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. Man, I remember those lyrics hitting me hard at the time. Like, like, whoa, this is deep. This is painful because within, it, it was an utterly terrifying notion to me at that time to, to, to be left behind by God. To contemplate the idea that there might be a time in a life where in one moment you're with someone and in the next moment, they're gone because they followed God and are saved by Jesus, and you were not. That was just a profoundly 
terrifying idea for me. And these words are, of course, drawn from the words of Jesus as recorded in Matthew chapter 24. It seems that as Jesus and the disciples were walking past the temple in Jerusalem, which was in the end stages of being rebuilt by Herod, um, he said something to the extent of, not a single one of these stones and these buildings of the temple and the buildings around it that had been built, not a single stone will remain on top of the other. Now this was probably a rather energizing statement for Jesus to say at that moment in that time. There was a lot of stuff going on politically, a lot of controversy, a lot of people who claimed uh, this side of their political spectrum and the other, a lot of people who said you fight for things, other people said you, you're passive for things. In fact, it was a lot like, to me, our current political climate. And Jesus said this edifice, this temple, this most important spiritual place in the nation will soon be gone. That probably agitated them. In fact, they were probably excited by this because then they asked when these things would take place. This is Jesus' response in Matthew chapter 24. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus, in this intense personal moment, says, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Pay careful attention to 12, 13, and 14. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I wish we'd all been ready. There will be a moment where that sentiment will be the only feeling that the majority, this is the tragic thing, that the majority of humans on the planet at that time will feel. I wish we'd been ready. Statistically speaking, it is a remnant of people who will believe on the name of the Lord and be saved. And yet it is available to all who would call upon the name of the Lord. I began to wonder at that time in my life, maybe with some better questions. Maybe the same things that the disciples were wondering in this conversation with Jesus. When would he, in fact, return the kingdom on earth as it was in heaven? And more personally, was I ready for that to occur? Who did I know that I know was not ready? What family and friends that if in that moment the Lord were to return and take his people home would not be going with those who knew him as Savior? I began to think of people specifically in my mind, some of my best friends, some of my family members, some of those that I knew in the communities who needed to hear about Jesus as their Savior. The interesting thing is, I'm convinced there are many who sit in churches this very morning and probably among us today who need to hear this as desperately as anyone who's never darkened the door of a church. The urgency to communicate to others, the dire nature of our spiritual condition without God is something that I felt then and continues to motivate me today. What specifically then is this gospel of the kingdom that Jesus spoke of? This seems to me, based on this scripture, 
to be an incredibly important thing for us to understand. What is this kingdom? Because I want to be a part of it. Well, the kingdom, according to Scripture, is made up of the citizens of heaven, the adopted siblings of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, specifically those who can claim to be one with the Father as Jesus is. You know, the only way into the kingdom is through the king, right? It's not through our own efforts. It's not through our attainment. Nothing on our own accord will give us this citizenship. In fact, with all of our efforts combined, we are utterly without hope. Now, we'd affirm that sort of in an intellectual way, but it's amazing to me how often we conflate, especially in the church, genuine, and I mean this genuine, genuine effort with actual salvation. I try really hard to live a good life, to read the Bible, to pay attention when Pastor Brandon or, or Chris are speaking, to, to make sure my stations are set to Caleb and not whatever devil music is on the radio. I do my very best to shop at Mardell and nowhere else. We often conflate the good works of people trying hard to be good with affirmation of salvation. We cannot make that mistake. We cannot allow that to occur. In fact, the Bible abundantly warns us from believing we are safe and saved or that we have more time to attain this because we are not safe on our own merits and we do not have more time. Look again at Matthew 24. Jesus is speaking very clearly to his disciples in verse 36, but about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. There was a guy in 1987-ish who wrote a pamphlet that said 88 reasons why Jesus is returning in 88. And he did the math. And he sold a lot of pamphlets. And Jesus didn't come back in 88. I'm like, well, we have to stone the guy, right? That's the biblical thing. <laughs> to go to his house, he's a false prophet, we gotta throw rocks at him. It, but then he came out with one and said, my bad, I did some bad math. It's really 89 reasons in 89. Which also didn't happen, right? Weren't there people who were just saying during, a, during an eclipse that the world was going to end a couple of weeks ago? People say this all the time. And what's interesting to me is that people believe these people all the time. Right? That people buy this. Oh, man, the end times guy said on channel whatever it was that any day now, in fact, probably by June 13th, we're probably going to, it's over. But Jesus said nobody knows. The angels don't know. The angels, when they find out, are going to be pumped. You all know that, right? When Jesus says, the Father says, it's time, they're going to, woohoo, they are going to go crazy in heaven. Jesus will be excited when the Father announces the return. But none of us will know until it occurs. None of us will know. As it was, he says, in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be watching the NBA playoffs on Sunday night. And then one will disappear and the other will be there. Two will be getting ready for graduation and prom. And they will plan trips and they're gone. Just like the days of the flood, when people thought they had all of the time in the world, it will happen in the blink of an eye. Jesus said, therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time, or what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. 
kingdom of God made up of the people of God who are made those people by God through Jesus Christ who must be ready for the return of the kingdom at a time that we don't know, who must be ready. What does it mean to be ready? The house clean? My backpack, my go bag ready? I mean, is that, is that what that means, that we have our 401Ks secured? Does it mean that we have our education finalized? That, what, what does it mean to be ready for Jesus' return? Because you would think from watching us that it meant some different things than what Jesus said it meant. Because we spend most of our lives doing other things in preparation for something that are not the return of the king. You know, the central work and, pur and purpose of each person on the planet, past, present, and future, the central work is to be made right with God. That's the work of the human. To be reconciled, made remade right with the God who created us to be in relationship with him. That's the work of our actual lives. From the first breath to the last breath, this is the work of the human. The actual central work and purpose of the person of Jesus Christ is also to reconcile us with the person of God. That's the work of the person, us, and the work of the Savior to come together to be reconciled before God. I want to paraphrase John 3, 16 and 17 just slightly. It says something like, it was the nature of God. And from this nature of God, which was love, pure love, that God determined the one pathway to redemption for all people. This pathway is and was only through Jesus, who declares as much in John 14, when he himself unequivocally states his deity and his sole claim to be savior of the world. John 14, five through seven says, Thomas was asking him a question. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Thomas was known for having questions. He was known for verbalizing those questions. Some of us have them and don't say them out loud. Thomas would say them out loud. Thomas asked the question, Honestly, I'm grateful because it was a question probably everybody wanted to know. Jesus was telling his disciples he was going. And they said, no, you're not. And he said, I am. He told them multiple times, I'm going. Thomas said, where are you going and how will we get there because we want to be with you? So tell us how to be there. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. I, I picture Thomas taking a deep breath and going, okay, good. I still don't really know where we're going, like going, going, but I'm, I'm going. I, I'm with you now. My eyes need to stay set on you, Jesus, because you say when you don't know the way that I am the way. My, my hope needs to be set on you, Jesus, because when my life is a shambles, you say you are the life. When I don't know how to discern right from wrong and up from down and next step, you are the one who discerns this for me because you are truth. Thank God Jesus gave us that affirmation of who he is. You know, when Paul was writing to the Romans, he wrote a lot of really interesting things, but much of it was about the ultimate nature of Christ and how salvation is available through him. That's really the arc of Romans, the work of that book. And it's a really interesting, like, like discreet verse that you can find in Romans 10.4 that distills this beautifully. The economy of language here is just remarkable. Paul says, Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Christ is the culmination of the law. Because you see, there are two ways to be saved, according to the Bible. Some of y'all say there's only one way. There's two ways in the Bible, right? The first way is, from your first breath to your last breath, you can live in perfect alignment 
with every command, every precept, and every law that God has given us. From the first breath to the last breath. Never wavering, never making a mistake, never messing up, never sinning. If you can just do that, you will be made righteous through your own efforts. You ever met anybody like that? Like, I mean, if you gave me like 12 hours to meet that standard, I don't think I could handle 12 hours. Two, one hour is a deep struggle for me to maintain my fidelity to God and his law. So if you can't do it that way, the Bible says the only other way is by the one who is the culmination of the law. Because the Bible says you have to be perfect to be saved. We cannot be perfect to be saved, but Jesus is perfect and can save. If we accept that, Romans 10, 8 goes on to say, but what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. In other words, Paul says, y'all know what's up. The Spirit's been, been working on you for a minute already. In your heart, you know what you need to know. You don't know the Bible in the original languages. You haven't studied the Roman road or the four spiritual laws or gone to the Baptist Vatican, a.k.a. seminary. You've never really been formally trained. Paul says it's in your, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart. He affirms multiple times that we will all be led before God and given the opportunity to confess our sins and to be saved. He says it again and again in scriptures. He says this, it's there. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are declaratory statements. There's no gray area. I love Romans. In fact, I like Paul's writing because he writes black and white. Very easy for me as a linear, sequential, logical thinker to go with Paul. I get his stuff, right? It's always if-then statements. If A, then B. If not A, then not B. It's really simple. If you, it says right here, believe that Jesus, in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone, who? Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame before, because there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him for everyone, who? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. A few weeks ago, when Brandon gave me the invitation to speak today, I was overwhelmed with gratitude. And as always, every single Sunday when I speak, nervous as a cat. Whew. Been doing this for a minute, and I don't get any less nervous because you just don't want to mishandle the Word of God, right? There's some things that happen to people in the Bible that say that's a bad deal, right? You just don't want to misinterpret something. You don't want to lead people astray. You don't want to miss an opportunity to convey truth to people who need and want to hear truth. And what happened in my mind at that point from that first moment when Brandon asked me until now, it's been clear to me that I needed to address a particular issue of whether or not our personal faith is in fact real or if we are just keeping up appearances. And it's an urgent message that I want to deliver to us today who are here. And if it's only for one person here, I am happy to deliver it. And I want to, I want to share in three concluding stories what Jesus said about this to drive this point home to his followers. If you look at the first one, it's found in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew, by the way, was a man saved from a successful business career. He was doing economically quite well. Thank God he was saved from that, right? Because sometimes the way we keep score in the U.S. is not the way God keeps score. Matthew writes of this account. 
in chapter 13, verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Jesus has just told a story. And as was prone to happen more often than not, I picture the disciples kind of wisely nodding in the background. Mm, amen. Mm, yeah, preach it, brother. But then when they get Jesus in private, what do they say? Boss, could you flesh that out just a little bit for Thomas? Thomas didn't quite get it, right? <laughs> Peter was nodding off. We just need to go back over these points a little bit. Now, at one point, I'm like, you know, Jesus would say things like, are you still so dull? Which was not a compliment when he would talk to his boys like that, right? You're kind of slow, kid. Pay attention, right? But on the other hand, the disciples genuinely wanted to know what it meant, right? They gathered around the teacher and said, could you go back over that point? I didn't get it, but I want to know it. So I'm going to give them some credit when they asked this time for him to explain the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered. He says, the one who sowed this good seed is the son of man, speaking of himself in third person. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. Now, pausing right here, the scenario had been there had been a field planted with good seeds. The enemy had sown bad seeds. The wheat and the Bible calls them the tares had grown up together, appearing very similar. And there was a conundrum. What do we do about the bad, the, the bad plants, the, the weeds among, among the good plants? And the harvester said, I'll take care of this when I harvest. I'll take care of this when I harvest. The enemy who sows them, verse 39, is the devil, the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Well, now, now, this is not a hyperbolic parable. This is not a symbol, it's a symbol of an actual event. When Jesus says, there will be a day when the angels come and do this work, you can bet there will be a day when the angels come and do this work. Let it sink in for a moment. When we look at verse 40, as the weeds were pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The end of the age is the end of time as we know it. Time flows in a linear path created by God with a beginning and end. He exists outside of time, has no beginning and no end, and he can dip into it whenever he wants. He can start it and stop it whenever he wants. And he has said there will be an end to this age, an end to this time. The son of man, verse 41, will send out his angels and they will weed out of, out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now this wasn't some angry Jonah prophet kind of yelling this in the wilderness. There's a whole bunch of Old Testament prophets that were always angry. Did you notice that? Always hollering at people. And our pictures of Jesus, kind of this nice guy that walks alongside people and he's friendly and caring. This is Jesus speaking about the fiery damnation that awaits the end of the age. He says, we will release the angels to make this occur. This will happen at the end of the age. And those things that you thought were real, that were fake among the real, will be separated at that time. Those things that appeared to be godly but were not. Those people who appeared to have religion but did not have a relationship with God will be separated from those who do actually have a relationship with God. Lest you think that was a one-off, look at Matthew 13, 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. Again, this kingdom of heaven, very important concept. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. Jesus again states, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Now, there used to be a whole lot more hellfire and brimstone preaching from pulpits in our nation. There used to be a whole lot more, conf- I, I, I guess, conflict generated from the pulpits where people had to confront the condition of their well-being. And if it wasn't in the churches, it was on the street corners. And it was in the halls of Congress. And it was in the newspapers where people confronted the reality of people's condition before God. Jesus certainly did it. He preached this. Jesus did this earnestly, desiring, the Bible says, that no one should perish. Jesus doesn't want the angels to have to do this work. That's clear. He says it will happen. He came so there would be far fewer to be separated in that day. I want to give us one more of these passages. Matthew 25, verse 31. Again, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Not if, but when. This is the inevitable end of the age that will occur. When the Son of God returns in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. The king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world for, for I was hungry and you, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. You see, these are not the actions that make one righteous. They are the actions that confirm that we are already made righteous. The love of Jesus Christ just leaks out of Christians because we can't contain the king of the universe inside of our measly bodies. The power of God flows through his people and it results in things like what James defines as pure religion, to look after widows and orphans, to care for the sojourner, to make sure that the poor who will always be among us, Jesus said, are cared for. The actions of those people who are genuinely restored by the grace of Jesus Christ are evident. Maybe not so evident to them though. Because you see in the next passage, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry? And feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink. That's crazy that we would provide anything to Jesus. When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in or or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me. We know this verse, right? We know this verse, but this is the confirmation in this context of who belongs to the king and who does not belong to the king. Those who were ready for the return of Jesus are those who have been on mission for God in their day-to-day lives. It's clear. And then in what has to be one of the most terrifying moments recorded in, in the scriptures, he will turn to those on his left. Wouldn't you hate to be on the left? Because you see, the scripture doesn't say there's another place to be. Earlier in that verse, he had gathered all the nations, all the people, all those who've lived in the past, who live in the present, and who will live in the future will be gathered at the throne on that day. And there will be two groups, a great separation that the great shepherd takes care of in that moment. 
And then when he turns to those on his left, this is the most horrifying moment in all human history. It's also the most righteous moment, the most just moment, the moment that could absolutely, listen, absolutely be avoided by everyone who is on the left. Because the Bible teaches us that God will never enslave us to his love, but he will always offer us his love. Every single one of us. He turns to those on his left and says what must be the most horrifying thing ever. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for One of the least of these you did not do for me. Again, these actions are not the things that that save you. They are confirmation that you have been made a new creation. They're the, the actions of those who've been saved, to whom much has been given, much is given by to others. And then he says this thing that affirms the last two stories. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. There will be a great sorting at the end of the age. That's affirmed again and again and again. It's affirmed in in direct scripture, in the life of Jesus. If this were not true, and these people who treat this idea of universalism, it says that God loves you so much, he will eventually let you all be saved, have not paid attention to who Jesus is. If that were true, Jesus would have never come to live a perfect life, to be tortured, to die, and to be resurrected on our behalf. He wouldn't have to if God was just going to save us all in the end anyway. So don't believe that that tripe that comes out of people who preach those false prophets that Jesus said would arrive, that people would follow are in our midst, on our televisions, on our podcasts, on our radio, on our bookshelves even today. Read the word of God and affirm what they say, to be true or to be false. You know, a lot of people think about in sort of weird way, are we living in the end times, Right? What are the signs? What do the prophets say? And it is fascinating. I remember when I was a teenager being fascinated by prophecy and even the quatrains of Nostradamus, this guy who was telling the future. And he had this like, I don't know what, 14th century view of the future. And everybody's like, whoo, this guy was something. He probably had a dark, evil spirit in him is what he probably had. Living in the end times. Are we in the end times? Yeah, you're in the end times. You want heartbeat away from the end of your time. <laughs> Every single one of us is in the end times. What, what, I mean, what we should be looking at is what our end time is, not what the end time of the earth or the, or, the, or the nation or the country or our political party. All that's nonsense. None of that makes any sense in relation to our own end time. And you are living In fact, you're 25 minutes closer to your end time than you were when I started talking. You know that, right? One heartbeat away, and we're there. We're almost there. No matter if we have a lot more heartbeats or not, every single one of us will be gone before too long, physically. And none of us will be gone spiritually as a soul. None of us will cease to exist. We are eternal, immortal creatures with the beginning but no end. And Jesus said, I want you to have no end with me, not no end in what you deserve for your sin. It's that clear in the scriptures that there will be a great sorting. I'd ask you today then, if this is true, and you need to determine... 
and you are not yet saved, what in the world are you waiting for? What could possibly be more important to an individual human being than the confirmation of eternal life versus eternal damnation? Now, again, the Holy Spirit makes it clear. There may be some things you're still sorting through, but right now, if you're in that position, you'll feel an urgency inside of you you can't explain. Many of us have felt it. It was a pressure, a calling, a voice, or intimate ways that God spoke to us that said, at this moment in time, you can become a child of the king. Jesus said, I've saved you. If you want the salvation, it's yours. I won't force it upon you. And if that's true, which I absolutely believe, then what would you be waiting for today? What could possibly be more important than making the decision to follow Jesus? And making certain that in those end times that Jesus said, when there is a great sorting by the angels in heaven and by the, by the God of the universe himself, don't you want to be absolutely certain which side of that great room you're on? That urgency I felt when I heard Larry Norman's kind of goofy song from 1969. It's not a great tune. But man, it's hard to get out of your head and heart. I wish we'd all been ready. I wish we are all ready now. That literally, whether it's today or 50 years from now that you take your last breath, that you are ready. A more contemporary singer, Crystal Lewis, says it quite well. And this is what I'm going to close with today. Lord, I'm ready now. I'm waiting for your triumphant return. You're coming so soon. This world has nothing for me. I find my peace and joy solely in you, only in you. I want the world to see that you're alive and living well in me. Let me be a part of the harvest for the days are few. You're coming soon. So people get ready. Jesus is coming. Soon we'll be going home. People get ready. Jesus is coming to take from the world his own. People get ready. Jesus is coming. Soon we'll be going home. There's a day that comes when we will be divided right and left for those who know him and those who do not know. And those who know him well will meet him in the air. Hallelujah, God is with us. And those that do not know, they will hear, depart, I knew you not. For my friends, you see, there will be a day when we'll be counted. So know him well. Know him well. Years ago, Pastor Jerry invited me to come and preach in April at Together Church. I was scared when Pastor Jerry spoke to me on He's like my spiritual grandpa. I mean, I just, I respect him so much for his lifetime of faithfulness through so much. And he said, when you preach, you assume no one, including me, he said, is saved. Bring the gospel. I believe because Western Hills and Together Church, long history of faithfulness to that message, there have been is now and will continue to be a great harvest of people who come to know Jesus because of the faithful preaching of this church. Thank you for being people who believe in the power of God to save all, all who believe. The Jews, Greeks, and Okies all together. Today is your chance for this to be your spiritual birthday. To say today... I reconciled my life through the blood of Jesus Christ with the person of the God of the universe who wants me to be with him forever so that on that day when there is a separation, I will stand before the throne made right through the work of Jesus Christ and no work of my own. Now, I want you to be agitated right now if you're not ready. I want your spirit to be uneasy right now because that means the Holy Spirit is working on you, is giving you a chance today 
to receive salvation. Now, some of you knew you were supposed to have invited a friend to church today, and they're not here. So you've got to go talk to them after this church, after the service. Somebody is a burden on your heart, like my friends were. When I heard those songs so many years ago and still feel that pressure now. In this moment, you can be saved. In this moment, you can be certain. And don't be worried if somebody thinks you're already saved and you're not. You've been sitting in church for 50 years and you're just now realizing it wasn't real, then make it real. Don't let your pride or something silly get in your way, right? There's nothing that should come between you and God right now. And I can promise you that the saints of God here will rejoice with you when you become a member of our family. It's not just the Brewsters that love to adopt people. We love to adopt people. The family of God is nothing but people who are adopted. Would you stand with me at this time? I'd like Together Church's invitation team to come down. Those of you that would receive people who would give their heart to God today. Some of you didn't know when you showed up today that today is the day you're going to be saved. But it's going to be today. I want to pray over you. And when I say the words, amen, you get out here and talk to somebody. Let God work in your heart. Move forward today. Father, I pray that today is a day where you are glorified in the salvation of individuals, even whole families that would come to you today. That today you would receive glory and honor because we accept the gift of the sacrifice of our brother Jesus Christ. That today would be a day when the numbers on the right increase over the numbers in the left. Where we see those that have been sowed as good seed who remain in the end times, Father. Given their eternal reward that's already been prepared for us before the beginning of time. Today, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit has already gone ahead and done the work to prepare the hearts. It is in the great and mighty name of our Savior, Jesus, that we get to pray. And we say amen and amen. Don't wait. At this time, if you would like to receive Jesus as your Savior, come down. Come down and take care of this. Now's the time. Now's the time. Come down and pray with somebody who will rejoice with you today. Be certain, no doubt in your mind today. No doubt in your mind today. If there's somebody next to you, you've been praying about their salvation, get in their ear right now. God put you here for this time and purpose to encourage them, to pray for them. Let them know you don't want to be gone and them left standing here. in prayer at this time. Don't just bide your time till lunch. Be praying for somebody that needs to be saved. Father, we are grateful for this time where we can gather in your name and consider your word. I'm grateful, Father, that this room is full of mostly, if not entirely, people who will be with you in the end times, Father. I pray that if there are folks here today who've not yet given their heart and accepted salvation, that Father, please don't give up on them. Continue to come at them, to woo them, to pursue them, to give them chances, Father, to know you. We thank you for your perfect blend of justice and grace, of righteousness and love that allows us to even hear from the Spirit and to learn from the Word and to come to you through the Son. We're grateful, Father, for the chance to be obedient today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing. Pastor Brandon.